<laughs> Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Manager, and I am your host today. We want to thank our sponsor today, the Weavers Guild of Greater Baltimore. Thank you all for sponsoring our episode today. They're an amazing guild. Go check them out at their website. And again, thank you so much. We will take questions as usual at the end of the program, the last 15 minutes, but please put them in the Q&A and not in the chat. Love all the chat. That's great. We get to love those comments, but I can't read those and see them to make sure I get the question. So if you would, you can put them in the chat if you like, but also put them in the Q&A. Today, we are honored to have Annalisa Hedstrom. Okay. Annalisa's signature Shibori textiles are in the collection of the Hewitt Cooper Museum the Museum of Arts and Design, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the De Young Museum, the Oakland Museum, the Racine Museum. She's all over the US. She has completed public art commissions for the Emeryville City Hall in California and the American Embassy in Brunei. She has exhibited throughout the United States and internationally. She is a frequent instructor at the craft schools and international symposiums. She has received two national endowments for the arts grants, and she is a fellow of the American Craft Council. And as you can see, she has beautiful work. We are so excited to have her on here today. Hi, Annalisa. Hi, I'm delighted to be here. Well, good, we're gonna have fun today. Thank you for inviting me and doing all the prep work. Absolutely, absolutely. First question, what is your favorite tea? Hibiscus. I'm drinking some now. It's a wintry day. We've come through all the California storms okay, but um, <laughs> it's been dicey. Uh-oh. Well, we're glad you're with us. <laughs> How did you get started in fiber? Well, I I had a mother who had been a high-end seamstress and designer in Cincinnati. And when she got married and moved to Indiana and had three girls, we had a costume box to die for. I bet. I mean, she she made, this was the era of, you know, honeymoons on the Queen Mary and trousseaus. So we had bias-cut gowns to play with, mm. totally at will. And... I, today, I could tell you all about the fabrics of these dresses, the hammered silks and the chiffon and satin and so on. So it was in my blood. That sounds like a great time growing up. Everybody loves to play costume. How wonderful. So would you tell us how you went from Mills College with an art degree to studying at Kyoto um, University of Art. What a leap. Well, it was actually a little zigzag. Um, Mills College had a good art department and a great uh, art history department. And I fell in love with Asian art history and decided I had to travel. Uh, there were no textile classes, of course. Um, I did take ceramics and I thought I'll go to Japan and study ceramics. So I did an independent graduate study um, at the art college. I didn't have to speak the language or take classes. And I ended up teaching English conversation to some big companies. And I had enough money to travel the slow way home around the world. And, you know, by the time I got back, I was going to be in textiles. So did you see textiles in all those places that you went? Well, oddly enough, I was so busy in Japan, I didn't pay that much attention to the rich history of textiles in Japan. I mean, um, mind you, this was at the, you know, towards the end of the 60s and Issei Miyake was in Paris interning. Uh, you didn't have... You know, women did not dress up in kimono except for holidays and weddings. And I just didn't know anything and was not exposed to um, the amazing, amazing traditions. So, but going to Southeast Asia and India on my way home, people were wearing their national fabrics and costumes. And I thought, 
this is it. So, of course, when I came back to the States, I realized how much I had missed in Japan, and I wanted to make up for it. <laughs> well, you describe your work as a um, conversation between East and West. Can you expand on that? What do you mean by that? Well, when I came back to the States, <clears throat> I took a class at Fiberworks taught by uh, Yoshiko Wada. What luck was this? Because I really, when I took the Shibori class, I had never even, I didn't know what Shibori was. Americans in general did not know what Shibori was. Maybe we knew a little bit about batik and screen printing, but this was totally, um, it was not a common practice, nor it wasn't part of our vocabulary. So when I took the class, I fell in love with the kind of both the simplicity and the sophistication of um, shibu traditional shibori. But from the beginning, I knew I would never equal the skill level of traditional artisans. And But what I had was, you know, I could play with the concept and push it. And with my American eyes, um, and experience, I I could play freely freely with different fabrics and experiment. That's really what I mean about going back and forth. But I always call the Arimatsu tradition of Shibori my teacher, my sensei. Oh, really? Oh, okay, okay. Um, when I look at your work, I'm both um, intrigued by your use of space. Um, the positive and negative use of your space. It's its just a, an aspect, is that an aspect of surface design that, that you really love? And I have to say the one on the right, I just love because at the bottom, it's like the dark is the, the background and then you get toward the top and now the light's the background. Just that play of light and dark is wonderful. So is that an aspect of surface design that you really like? Uh, absolutely. I talk about, a this a lot when I teach. Mm -hmm. And I'm always looking for that play. Uh, sometimes I call myself a collage artist at heart, because the first thing I did, and this is where the Western side of me uh, came out right away, I would produce fabrics, and I love dyeing them, and the patterns I achieved. However, I would start cutting them up and rearranging them and uh, playing with color and, as you say, positive and negative space. It's beautiful on both of these, but they're so different, but yet they have that same uh, on the commonality. Left, the left is a um, wool felt wall hanging. It's Ooh. actually about, you know, it's at least, it's over two yards high. And on the right um, is a coat. It's actually at the Philadelphia Museum of Art right now, uh, mm -hmm. their collection. And it's also one of my favorites uh, because of that, you know, I'm, I'm attracted to abstraction and uh, obviously geometry uh, and just the play of large shapes and little shapes and shading and so on. Well, this next piece is a great example of another aspect of your work I just love is that it just feels so alive and organic. I mean, it just flows um, yeah. and has a lot of energy. Is that is that your energy? Do you have that kind of energy or? Well, I hope so at my age, <laughs> relatively, <laughs> relatively speaking. Uh, well, as we all know, Shibori creates textures and pleats, and that's one of the great attractions. And I think particularly for the Western designers getting into artware, uh, you know, that was the appeal. These are things we have never, weren't, weren't used to working with. And so mm -hmm. it was in, in, inspiring. Uh, this is actually on polyester organza, uh, and it is, a, actually it's stitched and not, I'm not, I don't consider myself a good hand stitcher, but there's uh, it's a variation of karamatsu hand stitching through folded and layered uh, organza. 
and then it was put in a heat press. And this uh, actually bends the synthetic fiber so that it's permanent. I also used a transfer technique of uh, a dye that was painted on paper and then uh, transferred through the heat press on top of the folds. Yeah, there's something very dynamic and alive about shibori pleats. Mm -hmm. It does. It's amazing. Um, it, a lot of artists, when they, they work, they make a certain type of end product, if that makes sense. But, but your work is really spread out. I mean, you do wall art, you do clothing, you do accessories. As, and we've got some examples of these here. Did it take time for you to try these different forms of your work? Or was this something that it just flowed for you that it doesn't, it, you can jump from a coat to a wall hanging without any kind of problem. Does well, that make know, sense? <laughs> oh yeah. You know, it was kind of interesting when I was doing a lot of fashion and artware, um, I would get orders and I would have to repeat something and I would discover a pattern, something new I was doing and love it and use it. And then something happens. It sort of gets static and dead. And I'm going, it's the same thing I've been doing. Why does it feel that way to me? So I would always have this impulse to move on. And I think what's driven me is a kind of curiosity. What if, the what if? What if I use silk chiffon? What if I use linen? What if I do a thin fabric as opposed to a thick fabric? Uh, you know, the fabric talks back, and I say this all the time, and I tell that to my students, you know, it's it's a conversation because what often happens is that you have an idea, but then you try it, and the fabric talks back and says, <laughs> I won't do it that way. Uh, but if you look at it, it will give you a clue as to what to do next. It really is a back and forth. And this is what's, this is what's dynamic about uh, studio work for me. I, I tell you, I will not look at problems on the loom the same way again. Whenever I look at it now, I'm gonna think, it's talking back to me. Don't you be talking back to me. <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> I, I will make an admission. Uh, okay. Before I did surface design, I learned to weave. I was also a spinner and a natural dyer in the 70s. Uh -huh. I, I would be so frustrated because I'd have something on the loom and I'd go, uh-uh, I want it this way. But, you know, you're it's <laughs> what am I going to do? Take it all off the loom? And right, so, right. Uh, fabric, I felt, was more forgiving. Um, I could be more painterly with it. Um, mm -hmm. I could do a lot of uh, what I call drawings where I just do little samples. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it was for me a real fit. Um, before we lose this image, I want to ask you about the one on the left, that coat. <laughs> now, I think I can tell from here, but do you normally um, dye the fabric and then sew it? Or do you ever take the coat finished and then process it? Um, all the fabric is dyed before okay. it is uh, sewn, unless it's dip dyed, you know, where oh, you, okay. you want a shading or an ombre feeling. But that, that that's a, not typical. Uh huh. And can you tell us a little bit about these scarves? What was the process with these scarves? Yeah, the the uh, kind of the violet one. Uh -huh. is, it's a clamp resist, and the <laughs> clamps, uh, uh, the blocks that I used actually have grooves cut into them. And this is a process that was done in Central Asia. It's ancient. We don't know the real origins of the concept, but there are examples of this to be found um, along the Silk Road uh, in China and all the way to Japan. So I found that pretty intriguing, and I could talk on and on about it, but I had blocks uh, cut, wooden blocks, and then later uh, some other some synthetics 
uh, polypropylene, I had CNC uh, routing to cut bars, shallow bars, well, about quarter inch deep into these big blocks. And then in the case of, I mean, that's one thing, and you'll see some work where I've, I've just used the blocks as the pattern. But the scarf on that uh, slide on the right, the purple, I pleated the fabric and folded it before it went into the carved block so that when it opened it up, there were mirror images. Mm -hmm. It was really fun. I never know exactly what I'm going to get. It's hard to control. Um, I have a pretty good idea with some practice, but um, this was one of my explorations and I'm still doing this kind of work today. Well, we've got people asking about the one in the middle. I've talked about the other two. We can't ignore the uh, one in the middle. middle. <laughs> I, call, I call them stars and it's hard to see, but it's what I call a studio art quilt. Um, it's also more than two yards high. And it's actually made of rectangular pieces that are about eight by 11. And each one is folded. I started with black fabric, folded it, wrapped it around a pole without pushing and put it into um, a discharge, a color removing uh, solution. Wow. Then I actually, um, tie, actually this is not quite right. They were stitched down with the, the folds were stitched down with the sewing machine. Now this piece is so old, I've forgotten. Uh, and then, uh, so that acted like a clamp. Mm -hmm. And then before I undid each piece, I put it into a die that only um, took to the surface of the folds. This sounds rather complicated. And uh, if, if I were in a studio, I could show you in, you know, 60 seconds flat. What's the cloth? Done. It's actually a silk noil. I oh. like that kind of uh, nubby matte quality because uh, with my artware, I love to use a fabric that draped or was, you know, a charmeuse that had uh, a sheen. Uh, but with the art textiles, I prefer a real matte, uh, almost textured quality. I also like to work with um, cellulose, but the, you know, the silk takes the dye so beautifully. I often go back to um, a silk noil or um, maybe a silk broadcloth and mm -hmm. work from there. Oh, okay. Well, the next image we're gonna talk about is a work called Ladder. And you you mentioned it earlier that this is felt that you um, did shibori with. So would you talk some about, I, I love it because you're bringing together unusual combinations. I mean, most of us have either seen or done shibori, but when I saw this was felt, I thought, now that's different. At least it was to me. So could you talk some about these pieces? Or actually, it's one piece and one's a detail. That's right. Now, actually, I don't know if you noticed, it's actually two pieces, but it was part of a series. So the detail on the right is um, the detail of a companion piece. Also, oh. Also I, I knew that. I knew that. Sure. I knew in that. any case, <laughs> no, it's easy to mistake because after all, it is the same technique. Uh, you can imagine my thrill one day mm -hmm. when I was sort of browsing uh, through Joanne Fabrics where I don't expect to find much. I was actually uh, looking to uh, looking for some uh, synthetic felt, which I use and I'll talk about later. And lo and behold, they had a bolt of 100% wool felt. And, you know, this was a time when uh, the designers were talking about um, boiled wool. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. You know, felting was just too arcane for the general public. <laughs> and uh, so I went, oh, that's nice. It wasn't even that expensive. So I started playing with it. And if anyone knows... Uh, a lot about natural dyes, you do know that wool is particularly receptive to natural dyes. And when I, this was at a time when I decided to go back to natural dyes. I had uh, 
particularly producing artware, I felt a little bit of pressure and practicality really from uh, the commercial end. How could I tell a, a buyer, a Bergdorf Goodman, that I could not reproduce uh, that particular shade because the flowers wouldn't be blooming until the end of summer and you, know, you get the picture. <laughs> and so I've actually learned to use and master all of both fiber reactive dyes and um, silk acid dyes, particularly for the clothing. And there's always the um, fugitive fears of natural dyes. And, uh, you know, you can't, or even rubbing off of indigo on a white sofa or something, you know, it was always a little dicey with the clothing. But with, um, when I started doing these wall pieces, I, I was really eager to get back to natural dyes. So this is matter, indigo. Oh, really? Uh, there's some, I see some pomegranate, honestly, I don't remember exactly, but those, those are, those are dyes I use frequently because they're particularly the matter, uh, this is what we call a one, uh, one bath method where it's really very acidic. So it's an orangey matter. Uh, and oh, this this felt from Joanne's just sucked up the dye so beautifully. I just I love it. And so I did a whole series of these wool kind of blanket uh, wall pieces. They are with the carved blocks. And it's interesting. I had mm -hmm. my, because of, you know, originally in China and Japan and elsewhere, the blocks had to be hand carved and they were you know, elaborate, almost pictorial patterns, like a maze with, uh, and they were so cleverly done, very ingenious, uh, because there were pigs, so they could block off some of the channels, so that would go into one color, hmm. come out blue, then they could change the plugs <laughs> and put it into red, so they could have, you know, four or five colors on a piece of fabric of course these were really for the the elite these had to have been very expensive valuable uh textiles uh there are examples of them in the show so in 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 nara uh but of course now we're doing them a little more guesswork of how and what they did and who wore them and who made them but um they, the pictorial images, of course, took a lot of skill to carve into these multiple blocks. And, but with CNC routers, <laughs> I could have blocks carved in all kinds of elaborate ways. But you know, I ended up only really using the stripes. And there's something about having a limitation and of course, the stripes never quite turn out the same. So there's kind of almost an ecot kind of quality to the mm -hmm. edges. And uh, this spoke to my sort of sense of graphics. Um, I'm I'm still working a lot with these carved blocks, and uh, but now in a different way. Well, the colors are wonderful, and and we're going to talk more about color and dye, a, a bunch of people are asking about that. But um, the next thing I want to ask about is that you you push boundaries. You're talking about all the things that you're doing. This next image is a dress that I love. And then a piece that went with it. And I wanted to show both because I'm assuming it's the same process, just a different outcome, just a different use of this. Oh, so are you, are you the explorer type? Have you always been that way? I always think of Dora the Explorer. You know, you're out there trying something new. Have you always been that way, like as a kid or in high school? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's part of my personality. And, you know, I'm that kind of cook. A little bit of this and a little <laughs> bit of that. Um, I'm always, I've always been very observant and curious. Um, there's a little story about this, in a sense. This is, I mentioned shopping at Joanne Fabrics for some synthetic felt that's made from recycled plastic bottles. And when I was teaching at San Francisco State, oh, now quite a while ago, uh, San Francisco State has a great art department and um, it's a city college. So a lot of my students uh, had, you know, were working 
at the same time as they were going to school. I had um, immigrants, recent, you know, at all ages. And I thought, how can I ask this student body to go out and buy expensive silk? And I thought, well, let's work a little differently. And I knew something about the heat press and polyester and uh, transfer dyes and so on. So I ended up bringing, buying a stack of this cheap, <laughs> kind of garish sometimes, uh, synthetic felt from Michael's Crafts or Joanne Fabrics or wherever, and had them do shibori stitching really on them in small modular shapes. And then they would go into the heat press and they could transfer color. And uh, the class came up with great projects. Uh, some of them made jewelry. Um, you know, I can't remember everything they did, but I thought I'll see this in the final project. No, nobody continued with it. Oh. So I said, okay, it's mine. <laughs> and I took the rest of the fabric home because I had paid for it uh, and started experimenting. And the piece on the right really came first. It's called Ghost Forest. And um, I did a series of pieces that, uh, oh, I guess we all are overwhelmed with climate change. And I did some pieces that you know, kind of our metaphors for nature, but the changes in na nature. On the right is ghost forest and the leaf shapes change from dark and healthy. Actually, they're a little more green than they look here to white and in other words, dead. And then I did a piece called our blue, wide blue and black sea and the modular shapes uh, were about water and then all sewn together and you know there was sea foam and then at the bottom it was black and brown and it was referred to oil spills so a few years later um you know there's a wonderful wonderful program called the world world of wearables in new zealand and they every year have a competition <laughs> and a big fashion show it is really uh, caught the imagination of people all over the world. And so now entries are coming from, you know, China and Japan and Korea and Europe and Italy and so on. And I decided to enter a piece. And this is, uh, I can't pronounce her name, <laughs> Amphrotite, Queen of the Sea. She's Neptune's wife. And she is crying bitter tears of oil. There's uh, to accompany this piece is a big shawl, and it's all beautiful, uh, dripping sea foam, foam and blue, and then there are these long drips of brown and black oil. So this is this is probably mm. my own. You know, artware has a costumey side to it, but um, this is clearly a costume, and kind of an art costume really in my mind uh, it was also shown at a wonder the wonderful show at the philadelphia museum of art right before the pandemic started <laughs> and it was julie artisan's collection and more uh, so it was really the last i'd say uh, major artware show from from my generation that um that we've seen but this was also, I was happy that they showed this too. Well, it's, it's beautiful. I, I just, it just struck me when I saw it. So thank you for sharing with us. Um, I love hearing the story behind the pieces. It makes it just that much better, right? Um, <clears throat> this next one, again, is, is you take something simple and you just expand on it. And this is the install, it's an installation of paper airplanes. And I'm not even gonna try to explain this. I will let you do this, but this is just a wonderful example of taking something simple. We all know paper airplanes and you've raised it to art. So I'm gonna let you tell us about this. Well, <clears throat> I always, you know, 
there are times when I get restless and, you know, I'm not, I'm not happy with what's coming out of the studio. And uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I seem to be wedded uh, to Shibori or Shibori concepts, shall we say. But, uh, you know, I had always, I think anyone doing Shibori thinks of, oh, origami, we could do origami and Shibori. And I had tried that without much success because the the fabric can be so recalcitrant and doesn't want to fold in the same way that paper does. And you know, it never, never really worked for me. And then I had this eureka moment. I saw a folded paper airplane and I went, oh my God, I love this. <laughs> and I had been starting to play with paper and natural dyes in various ways. And it was one of these, it was serendipity because I had some beautiful Japanese uh, Kozo, you know, a strong fiber paper from Japan mm -hmm. that I got through a, a, a dealer in LA, a wholesaler. And so I took what I had from that stash and started folding it into a paper airplane as I remembered it. And then I went online and it's like, oh my God, there are hundreds of ways to fold paper into paper airplanes. So these are folded, wrapped on a pole and dipped, um, dyed in indigo. So the whole title is called Folded and Flat revealing the geometry of paper airplanes. And of course, as soon as I opened them up, I thought, oh, they look kind of like quilt patterns. And, you know, when I did a few more, I played around with them. I pinned them on the wall and rearranged them. This kind of, you know, there I go again. I want to collage. I want to move things around. Uh, and I was so entranced with the kinds of patterns that could be made, not only on the original folded plane, but in the compositions when you start rearranging them. So this installation um, is comprised of, of three columns of three compositions each. And then my husband made a little aluminum shelf that attaches high on the wall, and then uh, the actual folded airplanes can be uh, dangled on thread or monofilament. So, you know, the viewer can actually see, make the connection, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I um, you know, I spoke about how quilt-like they were to me, and I recently started playing with some of them in more quilt fashion uh but you know sometimes sometimes the real discovery is the magic i have to say and i hate to say this because actually i'm working on something that interests me a lot now but this i think it's just the best piece i've ever done over oh. 70 years old too well we're honored you're sharing it with us this is wonderful this is wonderful <laughs> well let's talk some about dying you know, and I always find it interesting when I talk to people about dying, there's this continuum. And on one end is the, oh, surprise, look what I made, what, what I plan, but I love it kind of thing. And then on the other end, there seems to be those people that they can't control it. It's frustrating. This isn't what I want. I'm going to keep going until I get what I want. Where are you on that continuum or, or have you been everywhere on that continuum? <laughs> Oh man, I've been everywhere on that continuum. And I'll tell you, I have boxes of disappointments. We'll put it that way. And some orphans. On the other hand, sometimes I'll go through these boxes of scraps. I, I'll give them away to teachers for school kids. I have friend, um, a niece who's does some costuming. I give her fabrics and leftovers, et cetera, et cetera. But once in a while, I'll look at something and go, oh, very interesting. <laughs> this could be revisited. And I always tell my students, sorry, this is will come up again, probably. I tell them there's no such thing as a, a failure or a success 
when you're doing a sample. A sample is information and you learn from the sample. And maybe it's not what you wanted, but maybe there's a direction in that sample. You know, there's the initial disappointment. Uh, you know, it's, I do think that you have to love the process if you're going to continue. Mm. And if it's all disappointment, go go back to the loom or go back to making paper or basketry or something where the process speaks to you. You know, I don't get really, I don't get really bummed by a, a disappointment or failure. Uh, I just, uh, after all, I can cut it up and rearrange it. I mean, that's the beauty of piecing and quilting is that, you know, that it all works if in the larger composition. We're going to change directions a little bit. At the beginning, you talked a lot about um, shibori and the history and these different techniques and how they came about. And I was really struck when I was reading about you and, and learning about you is that your art is about making, but it's also maybe as much as about the history. I mean, you're very, when I, I see you talk about your work, the history of the process is very much forefront um, when you're talking about your work. Is that true? Absolutely. I think we always have to acknowledge, you know, I mean, there's this truism where nothing is, you know, there you nothing is new and you can't invent anything. Mm -hmm. Well, there are times I have found, I thought I had invented a new shibori pattern <laughs> only to find out in the wonderful history of Japanese shibori, there was an example using the exact same concept. And, uh, you know, I think we have to acknowledge the past and honor the artisans who came before us and feel honored that if we are part of the continuum, what could be better? And if I am part of the continuum to keep um, these really kind of impractical processes alive and vital, I mean, I could, that's, maybe that's my life goal, uh, is, is to contribute to the larger field. Uh, yeah, I hope that some of my work uh, remains relevant, but uh, I know that my investigations are relevant. And What's I interesting? And I love the history. I just love textile history. I just collect all these books about, you know, uh, the trade that where things, ideas were brought to another mm -hmm. country. Um, Arimatsu, which is the little Shibori village that has influenced my work so much. Uh, you know, their history is so fascinating. And it's all, you know, textile history. You could study any culture through their textiles because it's about economics it's about agriculture you know dye plants fiber mm -hmm. it's about social issues marriage uh death birth uh age gender all those things are part of textiles and part of a culture and i'm i'm always 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 uh thrilled to read about to re learn and read about this. Well, when you were traveling, did that kind of light the flame of wanting to know about the history or was that something you were interested in before you um, took off to Japan and the world? Well, I never liked history much in college because so much of it was about war. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, talk about food, textiles, costumes, I'll, I'll soak it up. And yeah, travel definitely makes me curious about, you know, more. I want more. I want to know more about the context and where it came from and why it stopped or why it's thriving. Oh, I, I think that would be great. I want to go on a trip with you. Come on, Annalisa, let's go travel somewhere. Let's go find the history of where we're going. I'm I'm a gypsy at heart. All right. Well, you, you mentioned that you want to see these art forms and these processes continued. And that really slides right into my next question, which is another Shibori art, artist, um, uh, Yoshika Wada, who uh, many of us are aware of, 
she said that you are one of the two remaining masters of Arashi. Am I saying that right? Arashi? Mm -hmm. um, Shibori. And my question was going to be, do you worry about these techniques going away? And you've just mentioned that. So first of all, it, it dawned on me, you might want to explain a little bit about what Arashi Shibori is and then talk some about your goal of keeping that alive. Yeah. Um, I mean, most of us understand that when you talk about compression resist dying, which is another way of saying Shibori, is that you know, you're taking a, a flex flexible cloth and maneuvering it into folds and pleats, either by stitching, that's one of the primary ways. And what you find that around the world, you know, Japan is not unique that way. Uh, folding the fabric and using blocks to resist part of it. Uh, we mentioned the carved blocks. Arashi was, is really unique to Japan. And again, it, it uh, goes back to the industrial revolution in this little, shibori town where almost everyone worked with with making shibori textiles in one way or another mostly blue and white summer yukata and uh, the industrial revolution hit japan about in the 1860s and you know it changed everything economically for this this community of artisans because you know uh inexpensive summer yukata could be printed. They no longer had the travelers coming through their little town because trains set up uh, in a whole different other route. And there was a, a genius among the artisans who got this incredible idea. What if I wrap fabric around a pole? Now remember, kimono width fabric is very accessible. It's only 14 inches wide. And he used smooth down tree trunks to wrap the fabric around a pole, wrap it with string. And then two people, this was eventually, they figured out they would hold this log. It was a log uh, in a kind of a cradle with a crank at one end. And two people uh, would end up pushing it to one end. And, you know, I call it a language of stripes because, uh, what you're doing is really putting kind of stripe-like folds, but variations, many variations on that pole. And Yoshiko, when she taught the class I took at Fiberworks, um, brought in a description of this. And we this was a six-week class, and we, we were kind of introduced to something. And then we would go home and, and experiment and come back and talk about our results. She had never done this. Uh, this was like what? And, but I love the concept. How simple. We all went home and used wine bottles. And of course, that doesn't last very long. And then we bought cardboard tubes. Well, that doesn't last very long. Even if you verithane them, they get soggy in the indigo vat pretty quickly. So of course, PVC plumbing pipe. That was the solution. I mean, this is so remarkable, but so into the history of any textile technique. People pick, you know, from their environment to make tools, to see ways to use something. And the same has been true with the PVC pipe. There is a master in Japan, one master who has been teaching and recently has been giving workshops, um, including to some to uh, a Westerners. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, if it changes, fine, that's inevitable. Um, you know, my work doesn't, work that you see does not look like the traditional Japanese arashi, although I can do it. I have a certain amount of uh, personal pride in being able to replicate these patterns. Uh, in any case, well, you know, this is a question of so many things and so many artisanal processes. Can it survive and in what form? Mm -hmm. But, you know, um, let's say yes, it will. Yes. <laughs> well, if you keep working and you keep teaching, and speaking of teaching, I would encourage everyone to check out Annalisa's YouTube. It is a wonderful example of many of these procedures and processes. And it, it 
it makes it clear. You can understand what she's talking about. And I'm sorry well, we couldn't show them here today, but the they're YouTube, wonderful. The YouTubes are actually just little vignettes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're DVDs and they're streaming. Go to my website and contact me through that and I can tell you more. There you go. It's amazing stuff, amazing stuff. So what's next for you? Well, um, I could have shown some work from a series and this goes back a little bit to when I talked about, uh, oh, the, uh, you know, our wide blue and black sea and the ghost forest. Those were a, a series I called, uh, you know, it was about climate change. And now I'm doing uh, an installation of different iterations called uh, Thaw, Melt, Flood, Twist, Scorch, Burn. Wow. And these are uh, modular pieces, you know, anywhere from uh, 15, 16 inches and by 11 up to about 22 inches you know, not, not huge. Uh, and they're on industrial felt, which is more like working on a canvas. It's more like painting. Mm. I'm now, crazy about this new substrate. So you're in the middle of this series, right? Yeah, I, I've completed some um, and exhibited, but- Oh, that was my question. Can people see it yet? I'll have to get someone to put it on my website. <laughs> okay. No, I didn't know if you had an exhibit coming up. Not at the moment. All right. Let us know. We okay. want to see it. Good. Well, we've got questions. Can we move on to questions? Absolutely. All right. Some of them have been answered. So um, good. Yeah, we can um, zoom along. We'll, we'll keep going. Uh, here's a hello. This is from Susan Kessler Simpson. Hi, Annalisa. Don't know if you remember me. Met you at the University of Nebraska, a fellow Hoosier. We grew up 10 minutes apart. Yes. <laughs> oh, 10 miles apart. Yes. Where are you yeah. from in Indiana? Where'd small, you live? A small town called Hartford City. Okay. A real I grew up in Indiana. So. Where? Uh, down near at Evansville, another little tiny town called Elberfeld. Okay, another Hoosier. Yep. <laughs> um, so there you go, Susan, fellow Hoosier. Thank you for hello, your Hello, hello. She grew up in a farmhouse. And now at my age, I'm thinking, wow, I, I'd love to have one of those old Hoosier farmhouses. <laughs> I know it, I know it. Um, Debbie also, what are your dyes of choice? And you've kind of talked about how you've gone back and forth. Um, what is the source of your dyes? Do you have one place that you go to get dyes or? Well, I, you know, the commercial dyes, I get them the same place, you know, of, there are a few, few, you know, two or three places and mm -hmm. I find them totally professional and reasonable. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I like, <clears throat> I love fiber reactive dye. I like uh, the acid dyes for protein. Mm -hmm. uh, I have done some airbrushing and- Ooh. Oh, that would be fun. Excuse me, I've been talking too much. <laughs> so, well, I'm using natural dyes again. <laughs> I have a little- <laughs> You okay? Oh. <laughs> I feel your pain. I oh, it's the allergies just make me cough all the time. I always have my water ready. We're wearing you out, Annalisa. I'm okay. sorry. Okay. <laughs> you you good? I have a cough drop. There you go. Um, well, the next question was, um, here's somebody else saying hi. This is from Ann Alex Hauser. Hey, Ann. Um, <laughs> I spoke with Annalisa at MAFA this, uh, this past summer. She was working on a series of felted Shibori pieces depicting climate change. Is she still working on those? That's what you were talking about, wasn't it? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So, Ann, we're going to, we're going to attract those. We're going to try to find where they're going to be on exhibit so we can all see them. 
Um, somebody else is asking about dyes. You've just talked about that. Um, this is from Jean. She says, beautiful work, Annalisa. Please tell what the black dye is used with the matter wool, pomegranate stripy wall hanging. Actually, <laughs> it's indigo. Oh, really? And you got it that dark? Well, you know, girl. when it's mixed with another, over another dye. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you okay. saw the real piece, it would look like a deep, deep brownish red because it's over matter. Oh, okay. Um, now, this is an interesting question. Shibori, in your project, do you see it more as a noun or a verb? An end product or the process itself? Do you, you visually in, do you usually envision the finale or watch the fabric evolve? Well, both. At this point, because I've been doing this so long, uh huh. Yeah, I have. I have some idea of how something's going to turn out, and sometimes, you know, exactly. Uh huh. However, it's more, always more interesting to see it evolve. And to go from, you know, one step to another, does this need to be re over dyed or uh, does it work on its own? All those decisions come with the making. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think of shibori as a noun. I don't really use it um, as a verb. So I guess that implies that it's, I mean, it is a process, but I don't say, I don't, for example, I don't say I'm going to go do some shibori. Um, I will go do some shibori dyeing. I don't know. Isn't that funny? I know. I hadn't thought about it until she asked that. I was like, oh, yeah. Uh, somebody wants to know, what's on the horizon for you? What place haven't you been or technique do you want to explore further? Well, I'm asking myself that. Um, I'm not done with the industrial felt. I love working with it. And that's getting farther and farther away from anything that I would call traditional shibori. Mm -hmm. uh, there's there's a relationship, but not uh, the, the latest things I'm doing, which I won't even talk about, um, don't involve shibori at all. But it oh, is okay. a felt. And uh, I'm you know, I stopped teaching or doing travel teaching through the pandemic, but that's come back and I enjoy that. Um, although I'm cutting back, you know, the, the hassle of air travel and the schlepping of bags and, you know, I could be walking my dog. We, we need to get you, um, you need to be the sensei now. You need to get your followers to take over for you. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on here today. This was so much fun, Annalisa. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate it. You know, I know that we have an, an audience. We have textilians watching. So I felt very comfortable oh, and good. hope they could follow everything. And again, go to my website. You can contact me through there. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, thank you Mandy. Yes. Um, it, people have been asking about your website, and I encourage you to go to the website because there are, it's a wealth of resource. There's videos, there's information. Uh, like she said, if you want to see the little snippet on YouTube, you can, and then you'll know exactly which video you want to buy. Um, there's all kinds of information on there. Um, information about classes, her online classes. So be sure you check that out. It's well, be careful. It's from... Be careful. I haven't updated my classes. <laughs> at all. You know, who uses websites now? Uh, in general, in general, my classes uh, fill very quickly. Um, and, you know, I have two, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast coming up. Uh, and, you know, I think then I think there's still places. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay. So go to the website and, and contact you. That's the best yeah. way. I'll, I'll, that's the best way. And I can All right. tell more. All right. All right. Or if your guild, I'll, maybe she'll come through your workshop at your guild. Mm -hmm. No, no. Um, I'm, I'll be watching some of your programs from now on textiles and tea. It's perfect. Well, good. We're glad. 
Uh, we want to thank our sponsor, Baltimore, Greater Baltimore Weaving Guild, Weaver's Guild of Greater Baltimore. <laughs> Sorry, Baltimore. We appreciate you sponsoring this today. We had so much fun. I hope your guild did too. If you want to sponsor an episode of Textiles and Tea, please do so. Your guild, your business, you yourself, a group of you want to sponsor. Go to the website at weavespindye.org and go to Textiles and Tea, and you can see where you can be a sponsor right there. We also want to uh, talk a little bit about Convergence. Yes, this summer, Convergence, we haven't talked about it much lately, but there is so much to experience at Convergence. It's the 11th through the 14th, uh, the 17th, um, the marketplace to exhibits. Uh, we have more exhibits there than anywhere. There are beautiful juried exhibits and, of course, the runway fashion show, which is the highlight of the week. Um, our keynote is Nikaila Bigay. Um, she is a shepherd. She is an, um, an artist, a teacher, a storyteller, and a photographer. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I should say they is a photographer, a storyteller, and a teacher. Wealth of knowledge. You will love this keynote at Convergence. Um, they are also the executive director of the Rainbow Fiber Co-op, which she they have all put together a variety of shepherds in that area have come together to make this co-op to improve the financial and sustainability and equitable outcomes for the churro sheep ranches in the Navajo Nation. Um, it's an interesting um, article. If you see anything about it, it's an interesting story, what they've done. And um, you'll hear more about it at Convergence. So please come see our, us at Convergence and you'll hear this wonderful keynote. There are over 150 seminars, workshops, everything from 90 minutes to three days. Um, and you can find something that you want to do there. Um, please go online. You can see the uh, registration book. It has a description of all the classes. You can find out about the instructors and what you want to do. Or we've got tours. Can't forget those. Um, a variety of things for you to do in Wichita, Kansas, this summer, July 11th through the 17th. Um, if you would like to support these programs, Textiles and Tea, Careers in Textiles, the Guild Retreat, we do all the donations that you give to HGAs, make those programs happen and also make new programs happen. We appreciate it. If you're interested in joining or donating, you can do so at weavespindie.org. If you've missed any of the episodes, you can watch those again. If you want to watch this one again, this was so much knowledge. You might want to watch this again. You can do so on HGA's Facebook page or you can watch it on YouTube. I encourage you to sign up. Um, as a subscriber to the YouTube channel because you'll get a notice when something's been uploaded. Thank you so much for joining us today. It was so much fun having her on here. Um, I hope you have a wonderful week. Next week, we've got Annetta Kreyvelt and uh, you will enjoy her too. Have a wonderful week and happy tea.